everybody, welcome to Chin Fat. In this series, we've been going over basically pre-production process, which we're still in the screenwriting phase of that. Screenwriting is part of the pre-production process. So, so getting a screenplay to produce into movies, but later on we'll get into pre-production, uh, doing like scheduling and uh, script breakdown and shot listing and all these different things that go into uh, getting a film ready. Uh, so this episode, we're getting into dialogue, giving you some tips on writing dialogue uh, in screenwriting. So with that being said, uh, these suggestions come from, some of the suggestions come from AFI, from the America Film Institute. It's on their website. I've got some things we'll talk about uh, from Dr. a lady named uh, Dr. Laura Shellhart, uh, who talks about diction and the way people speak and the words that they decide to use when they when they speak. So we'll, that, that's what this whole episode is about. So let's let's dive into it. But talking about the nature of dialogue, they say that, uh, and the, you can find this on their website, they, they say that good dialogue is a cross between poetry and everyday conversation. Uh, this is really kind of interesting because it's almost like a contradiction. They say uh, good dialogue is rarely natural but should sound natural. And that's kind of like a, um, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about what they're talking about here. But uh, they, they say the best dialogue starts with everyday speech but strains out the redundancies and incoherencies, basically where people repeat themselves. If we hear something and understand it, you don't have to keep reminding us of it because we, we hear it and we get it. So uh, that's just an art of writing is making sure that you're straining out the, the redundancies. They mentioned that every scene has its own rhythm or tempo, and dialogue is often its drumbeat. So the, the pacing of the, dry, uh, of the dialogue will basically set the tempo for the scene. Uh, scenes with long stretches of dialogue or monologues are necessarily slower paced, so generally speaking, you want to avoid those. Uh, tension can be heightened by quickening the tempo of an exchange with shortened responses or regular interruptions. So, and I like this cl clip. I'll just show a little scene from the social net, from uh, the opening scene of the Social Network here, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, which is written by Aaron Sorkin, very uh, wonderful screenwriter in my opinion, uh, excellent screenwriter. But let's let's watch a little bit of this clip here, and then talk about it. My friend Eduardo made three hundred thousand dollars betting oil futures one summer, and Eduardo won't come close to getting. And the ability to make money doesn't impress anybody around here. Must be nice. He made three hundred thousand dollars in the summer. He likes meteorology. You said it was oil futures. You can read the weather. You can predict the price of heating oil. I think you asked me that because you think the final club that's easiest to get into is the one where I'll have the best chance. I. What? You asked me which one was the easiest to get into because you think that that's the one where I'll have the best chance. The one that's the easiest to get into would be the one where anybody has the best chance. You didn't ask me which one was the best one, you asked me which one was the easiest one. One thing you'll notice between the, the difference between those two characters, whenever you write dialogue, you're writing very distinct language for each character uh, that makes it, that will make, make up those characters essentially. So uh, everybody speaks different, everybody has their own what we call diction. So before we get too deep in that. Let me talk about subtext here. Sometimes what is left unsaid in a conversation becomes the most potent part. Screenwriters use the di uh, use dialogue subtext or what is under the text to hint at a conflict without actually identifying it. So basically that is saying that when people speak, like creatively within a screenplay, when people speak, there's something that that's implying what they're trying, there's something hidden behind what they're trying to say. Oftentimes people aren't straightforward and just come out and say exactly what they're feeling or what, what they, uh, like, like example in this is she's trying, to, uh, she's trying to change the subject because she's uncomfortable. So she keeps saying things in the scene here that basically describe that what she is saying is not exactly what she means though and there's even a part in this uh, in the scene where she keeps kind of saying things that she she's saying things that she really doesn't mean but she's trying to avoid this kind of uh, sticky situation or get into a conversation that might be heated uh, and then at one point mark zuckerberg basically accuses her of mark i'm not speaking in code erica you're obsessed with finals clubs you have finals club the OCD and you need to see someone about it who will prescribe you some sort of medication. You don't care if the side effects may include blindness. Final clubs, not finals clubs. And there's a difference between being obsessed and being motivated. Yes, there is. Well, you do, that was cryptic, so you do speak in code. I didn't mean to be cryptic. I'm just saying I need to do something substantial in order to get the attention of the clubs. Of being cryptic. And that being cryptic, she is actually using subtext. There's a different meaning behind what she was she is saying. When she says, I have to go study. Erica? Yes. I'm sorry, I mean it. I appreciate that, but I have to go study. Come on, you don't have to study. You don't have to study. Let's just talk. I can't. Why? Because it is exhausting. Dating you is like dating a stairmaster. All I meant is that you're not likely to currently. I wasn't making a comment on your parents. I was just saying that you go to BU. I was stating a fact. That's all. And if it seemed rude, then of course I apologize. I have to go study. You don't have to study. Why do you keep saying I don't have to study? Because you go to BU. I have to go study. What is she really saying? 
Is she saying that she has to go study? She's like, no, she just wants to get out of there. She's so uncomfortable by this conversation that she keeps saying, I have to go study. Now, the thing is with Mark Zuckerberg, and I think what's so creative with uh, with Aaron Sorkin, is he writes his character without subtext. Generally speaking, uh, you want to have subtext. That makes the story a little bit more interesting. But this is such an interesting character uh, that he is very socially awkward. And the irony in that, that this is a very socially awkward person is the founder of one, the, what became the largest uh, social media company in the world. And this person is very, very awkward socially. In fact, he has no filter, essentially. So he doesn't use subtext. He's, he comes out and he is very straightforward about what he is thinking, and therefore it comes across as offensive. So a very interesting distinction between those two characters. But with the well, going back to pacing, though, this, the pacing of the scene is very, very quick. When Aaron Sorkin wrote the scene, he said it was about like 13, 14 pages, I think. But he told the director, he says, don't worry, this is supposed to be so quick and witty. It's just so quick and witty. This is supposed to be delivered at such a, a quick and pace. Uh, that the scene will end up lasting like four or five minutes, which he was right when the director directed it that way. It lasted a lot shorter than the minute per page kind of general rule that you hear, hear when it comes to screenwriting. The scene from Chinatown is an example where, sorry, this is a poorly formatted version of the script here, uh, but where Gitz, played by uh, Jack Nicholson and Evelyn, paid by, uh, played by played by Faye Dunaway, when he's interrogating her, trying to find out who this other person is, and he assumes that she might be related to her and he doesn't know, he's, uh, he gets to this point where he's yelling and screaming at, at her and, and he basically slaps her saying, I want the truth, and she keeps saying, it's my sister, it's my daughter, and at the end she finally says, she's my sister and my daughter. And, the, and that's a little bit of subtext there as well because she's basically coming out and saying what? Well, she's saying that she was basically raped by her father and was impregnated, essentially. So that's uh, uh, so by saying she's my sister and my daughter, you're allowing the audience to do a little bit of detective work and kind of figure that out and go, oh. And then you go, oh, that, that's, that's what the situation is. So anyway. Moving on, let's talk about uh, diction based on the teachings of Laura Shellhart, professor from Northwestern University, talks about diction. What's in a word? These are two distinct people here, and this is what uh, where screenwriting can get quite difficult is trying to make characters distinct. So it doesn't because it's one person writing the screenplay oftentimes, but to ma but making a, a, a variety of different of diverse characters, and they each have to have their own speech and talk in their own way, and that can be difficult. Uh, so here's two different phrases here. Quit it, Sammy. I said put that thing down. I ain't saying it again. And you heard me the last four times, I know you did. Now I can take it or I can break it. What's it going to be? So that's one person there. And now here's another person saying the exact same thing. Now Samuel, stop that. I would appreciate it if you put that thing away. I've asked you nicely several times and I'm certain you've heard each request. Now you have a choice. You can either give me the toy or I can toss it in the garbage. Essentially the exact same thing but said in two different ways. These are two distinct persons. One might sound a little bit uh, more educated than the, than the other. And keep in mind that there's important distinction between intelligence and education. The way people speak based on whether, they're not, whether or not they're educated, uh, will, that will determine what, how people speak. And these are called diction's determining factors. Education, profession, geographic location, and overriding emotion. Education exists in many forms. Uh, just because you're uh, educated doesn't mean you're necessarily intelligent or vice versa. Example, we've got Mark Van Doren, a college professor in Quiz Show, is very proper, very, the way he speaks is, sounds like an educated person, somebody who's been through a lot of uh, higher education. Versus the con artists in Sting, they're very intelligent, they're, very, they're uh, able to con people uh, in a very intelligent way, but they are not college educated necessarily. So, types of intelligence, you have academic in intelligence, which will which will determine the way you speak. Uh, intuitive, you have someone like Sherlock Holmes, acquired Bronx character or mafia, someone that's like basically like street smarts that learn uh, a, a certain type of living in a certain culture or a certain type of society. Uh, they acquire an, uh, intelligence from the situation in, in which they are living. Think of the, uh, this is where uh, I think amateur uh, screenwriting kind of comes out and and is very, very obvious when you uh, have somebody that doesn't know much about basketball or somebody that doesn't know much about, where somebody doesn't know much about being a medical doctor or an astronaut for that matter. Uh, the terminology that you use is gonna just kind of scream out that this person doesn't know what they're talking about when they're writing and it takes them out of the world if the language is not, uh, is not accurate. So you sometimes have to do some research and maybe even have somebody like a basketball coach or a doctor or an astronaut read your screenplay, if that's possible, uh, to give them a, give you a critique on the language that you're being that, that you're using. So, uh, geographic location, of course, where you're from, southerner, foreigner, New Yorker, that will determine the way you speak, and and also uh, time as well. If it's uh, New York in the 18 late 1800s or mid 1800s, is going to be different from New York or modern day. So. 
Overriding emotion, they have one emotional state that they return to between dramatic events. This is their overriding emotion. I think of Juno, the way she kind of talks to her friends uh, versus the way she talks to her parents. It's kind of two different ways. She's very sarcastic, kind of monotone, the way she speaks with her with her friends, uh, especially her quote-unquote boyfriend this that ends up knocking her up. She's very kind of like, like sarcastic with them and trying to be a little kind of funny and witty with them. But then later on, when she gets very emotional with them, when she's like almost eight months pregnant and she's talking to this, talking to her boyfriend, she finds out that her boyfriend is going to prom with another uh, girl because she, uh, Juno basically said that she wasn't interested in continuing a relationship with him. So he started dating somebody else while she was still pregnant and ready to give birth, essentially, and going to high school. But the way she talks earlier on in the movie versus the way she talks when she's being emotional or to, uh, has two different... Uh, she tends to be meaner when she's, when she's angrier. But then when the way she talks to her parents are, is completely different. She tends to uh, kind of drop the sarcasm a bit. She tries to be a little bit witty sometimes, but she drops the sarcasm when she's telling her parents about uh, her, her being pregnant. One thing that you kind of want to avoid as well is using what's called low diction or neutral language. Every character, you want to get a little bit creative and talk, uh, and if somebody is from California and they're a surfer versus being East Coast, East Coast living in New York City, downtown New York City, living in a little apartment there, they're going to be, they're going to use different types of language. One might be a little bit more crass. One might think about, like I said, like a, a California surfer, the way they speak is going to be completely different than somebody from New York City. And here's some uh, examples of low diction versus high diction. This is very what they call neutral diction here on the left-hand side, low diction or neutral, uh, where they're using neutral phrases like nice, hate, glad. They basically state exactly how they feel when you can think of, now this is like a little bit more high diction, but, and then there's a way, way a, a lot of different ways of saying this depending on what char character type you're writing there, but try to avoid, generally speaking, neutral phrases. Think about what, uh, what does your character talk about, which, which roles your characters are playing now, whether they're at home or maybe at work, what's the status between the characters? Do they know each other really, really well? If you're very familiar with somebody, you're going to speak to them in a different way than somebody that you just barely met. Uh, what does each character want? How do they express this? Very important as well is knowing what the character's motivation is. You hear that all the time. But what is it that they desire and how do they, and how do they express this? Are they introvert? Are they extrovert? I mean, there's a, variety, there's a spectrum as well, but those are two, two extremes there, introvert versus ex extrovert. Okay, to finish up here, let's talk about some dialogue uh, do's and don'ts. Strong dialogue does the following. It combines distinct voices, which we've mentioned. It reveals character and relationships. It propels action forward. It conveys pertinent information or exposition. Exposition is when somebody is speaking and explaining something, so we're hearing it through dialogue. I think there's a really good example of that in Raiders of the Lost Ark. If we look up the script here, toward the beginning of, of the movie where we have these government people coming to Indiana Jones because Indiana Jones knows a lot about the Ark and, and about the lore and about why Hitler would be obsessed with this, with finding the Ark. So they come to a professor that teaches archaeology so they can kind of find out what's going on. And uh, here you're looking at this, this scene here and it's kind of like, you'll, you'll, you'll see the scene, it basically divides short sentences to everybody throughout. Uh, so it's, the, the scene moves really, really well. Uh, and then at the end, we see this. We see Indiana Jones uh, suddenly getting a little bit more monologue which is fine. This is very expository language that he's using here where he's explaining everything. He's basically giving them a lecture here. He's giving them a lecture about, about the history of the Ark, about the, about the headpiece of, uh, of Ra, the staff, and everything else, and where, the, and where the map room is. He basically goes through a big uh, monologue here. And look at this. This is almost like a full page of monologue. Starts out here. More monologuing, more monologuing, and he's basically teaching them about the arc here and the history behind it. But the interesting thing about this dialogue is it's very visual dialogue. Um, and we actually, everything that he explains here, we end up seeing throughout the movie where he talks about the map room. We see the map room where he talks about the headpiece and the staff of Rod. We basically see those and we know that he's got to stick the headpiece onto the staff, sticks it into that specific spot to when the sun's at a certain angle in the map room and it will reveal to them where the actual Ark of the Covenant lies. If you put the staff in a certain place at a certain time of day, the sun shone through here and made a beam that came down on the floor here and gave you the exact location of the Well of the Souls. So even though this is a big monologue that we see with no visual, well, we do see some visuals though. He goes to the blackboard and starts writing on the blackboard and we see these visuals as he describes them and then later on in the movie we end it. This is a huge setup uh, for, for the movie and one of the more expository portions of the, of the movie. 
So it once again prepares the audience for things to come, which I think that scene did really, really well. Suggestions, speak it out loud, let other people read it out loud, build your scene towards some point, and when in doubt, cut it out. Here's a, here's a couple phrases that are a little bit too on the money. This is kind of a do not hear, is don't be too on the money. Basically explaining, and, and Mark Zuckerberg, once again, was very on the money. Everything he was saying was basically exactly what he was thinking and wanting to say. And that is very different, but I think it worked in the context of the social network because he was supposed to be a very awkward, socially awkward person. And, uh, and once again, came across as offensive oftentimes. But here, very on the money here, a conversation between a daughter and father, maybe on the phone here. She says, Dad, I can't wait to tell you how glad I am that you called. I've been waiting all these years for some sign that you've missed me. So exactly how she feels. He says, of course I missed you, honey. I've been so miserable here alone. Just hearing your voice makes me want to cry. So maybe you think of a way of being more subtextual there rather than being so on the money. Don't be too repetitious. Uh, if you're seeing this, it comes across as kind of comedic. Maybe here, Larry, can you hand me a wrench? This wrench? Sure, Phil. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Laura. This wrench works on everything. But they say the word wrench over and over again. And oftentimes, just generally writing when you're writing something, if you see the same word over and over again, go back and think, can I change that a little bit? Can I take that out? Is that too redundant? Rather than, uh, can you hand me a wrench? Say, oh, this one? Sure thing, Phil. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Laura. Oh, man, this thing works on everything. You, you can reference it. Uh, rather than saying this wrench, but the word, you see the, the word wrench several times on the, on the same page, uh, it's too repetitious. Once again, distinction and, and characters. These characters, when you read through it, you won't know who's really speaking because it's very, very similar. No distinction between character. Maybe think of the language. Once again, the extreme of if this is a scene between that uh, California surfer versus somebody from New York City from different coastlines. Their, their conversation is going to be very, very different. And this is very plain using very, using very neutral language here. Don't get too wordy. Keep it short unless it needs, needs to be a little bit longer. Don't tell your story without dialogue. When you, when you can tell it with visuals, use visuals. All right, guys. Well, that concludes this episode on dialogue. In the upcoming episodes, we're going to be getting into a little bit more uh, complex story structure. We'll get into the hog story structure and the eight sequence story structure and kind of explain that these those ones are mostly used for... Uh, feature length screenwriting. If you're writing short film, there's still some things that would be good to know about when, uh, going through those complex story structure, but usually a short film is more like a, a beginning, middle, and end, a setup, execution, resolution, uh, which is uh, similar with a feature length screenplay. It's about setup, execution, and resolution, but there are a lot more plot points that go into a feature length screenplay. If you're writing something that's like 90 minutes or two hour uh, long feature length film, uh, that will, the, these, the hog story structure, the A sequence story structure is going to be Fairly important to understand, so you're just aware of that structure when you're writing, and make it more interesting, and make the pacing kind of kind of keep going within within a within a screenplay. Uh, anyway, yeah, well, thanks for watching Chin Fat. Uh, watch the next episode. Watch the previous episodes. Watch all the episodes. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll see you on the next one.